Uh, thank you very much. So as was just mentioned, we do have an EDX, Benchtop EDX, here at the MRL. It's been here since February, I think. Um, it also is available for use either after the talks today or tomorrow during the day. I'll be here all day, so stop in and you know, feel free to ask me to come show it to you guys. Um, I have a lot of slides here. I might just skip over a few because I only have 20 minutes. Uh, so if you see something that I don't talk about or you want to know more about, just come by the, the um, table tomorrow or later today or tomorrow and ask me about it. Okay, so what is XRF? Uh, it's an analytical method to, ter uh, to determine the elemental composition of a bunch of different materials. That's it. Purely elemental, no bonding, no oxidation, nothing molecular. A uh, very basic example of this, let's say we have a kitchen knife right here. We don't know what that material is. We could put it in an EDX as is, get these results, you know, iron 81, chrome, manganese, silicon. Uh, run that through a matching library if you have it, or if you just know by looking at it, that's uh, stainless steel or 440C stainless. Um, so in about 30 seconds, you can determine the composition of a sample. Um, can be also be used to determine the thickness and composition of layers, coatings, and platings. So let's say we have a penny. Uh, we know a penny is copper plated zinc. We could stick this in EDX and have it tell us that it's about uh, 15 microns thick copper uh, on zinc base. Um, three attributes of EDX it's fast, it's accurate, and it's non destructive. So if you have precious or limited samples, you can stick it in there, and once it's done analyzing it, open it back up and take it out. Another benefit requires uh, minimal sample prep. Um, most items, most samples, you could stick right in the EDX. Uh, some powders you may have to press into a pellet. You may have to homogenize a sample. If it's a liquid, you might pour it into a sample cell with a film on it. Um, but that's really it. Uh, sample form can be solid, liquid, powder, or it can be liquid deposited on filter paper and then that liquid can uh, evaporate. We could run what's left over. Before we continue, we'll, go, we'll have some clarification here. X-wave fluorescence, uh, there are really two main techniques. There's energy dispersive and wavelength dispersive, also non-dispersive, but these two are the primary XRF techniques used in research labs. We're not going to talk about wavelength, we're talking about just energy dispersive uh, X-ray. Wavelength dispersive util utilizes a diffraction crystal, so you can isolate a single wavelength and measure just that. Benefits of that, you get much higher resolution, thus better detection limits, but it's also much, much more expensive. Okay, what does that mean? Energy dispersive, the ability to discern the energies of X-rays. Uh, X-rays is a form of energy. It's the energy we're putting into the system. And fluorescence is just the phenomena where you absorb energy and then release energy. Here's the basic layout of an EDX system. You've got an X-ray source. Uh, can be a variety of different X-rays. Uh, in the Shimazu EDXs, we use rhodium source. Hits your sample with radiating X-rays, generates fluorescent X-rays, measured by the detector and processed. The detector is the most important component of the EDX system. I've got a few got some more information on that down the road, uh, but any advancements, in, any major advancements in EDS is going to come from um, the detector. Uh, X-rays, as I think every, as was talked about today, and everybody should know, it's just a kind of energy, just kind of light energy in between gamma rays and UV radiation. How do you interact with matter? Uh, some some X-rays are absorbed, some pass through. Uh, we are interested in absorption. As so a consequence of absorption is that other x-rays are generated from that sample which are characteristic of that sample. So that's what allows us to say, take some unknown, stick it in an instrument and have the computer tell us that, oh, that's iron. Some more interactions of x-rays with matter, uh, they can be scattered. This is the phenomenon utilized in x-ray diffraction. Uh, they can fluoresce a sample, which is what we're concerned about with EDX. They can be transmitted, which is medical, um, or they can generate photoelectrons, which is what XPS is used for. Some things to note, degree of fluorescence depends on thickness, density, and sample material. Um, so 
as a couple of examples here, let's say we have a rhodium source, the penetration depth of you know, a, 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 a solid lead might be 25 or so microns of iron, a few hundred microns, and water or other liquids, a few centimeters. Okay, that's how they interact with uh, matter, how do they interact with atoms? Well, let's get an atom. We have an irradiating X-ray come in, eject one of these inner shell electrons. Now we have a vacancy here. What happens? A higher energy electron falls down to fill that vacancy, thus releasing a fluorescent X-ray. This right here is what's measured. Uh, this fluorescent X-ray is specific to that transition of that element. Um, Notation-wise, uh, there, uh, the X-rays, um, and you'll see this on, on a spectrum uh, on different peaks. They're labeled by the atom, and then the K, either K L, M, uh, or N, the final resting place of the electron, and these, the alpha, beta, whatnot subscript um, refers to the energy difference. Uh, so I think I've got some other slides with an actual spectrum on that where you see my, we'll see that, that, that comes into play. Uh, one thing to note, the ratios are pretty set. K alpha, K beta, about five to one, and L alpha, L beta um, can be one to one or, or a little bit less than that. This is useful for determining interference. Um, if you've got a K alpha peak that's, uh, say, you know, this high, and you've got a K beta peak of the same element that's just about as high, you know that you're getting some sort of constructive interference. But if it's about that 5 to 1 ratio, that means you know you've got a clean spectrum. Uh, these are called characteristic x-rays. Uh, x-rays, I'll, I'll just pass by this quickly, uh, x-rays have energy. Um, so for example, we've got, we're, we're short on time. Uh, let's say we have this K-alpha transition, we have this nifty formula, uh, E energy is Planck's constant times the speed of light over wavelength, plug in some numbers there, and we get a theoretical value of 6.40 keV for this iron K-alpha transition. We can go to Google, find a chart like this, and we can look up on it and look, iron K-alpha, 6.40 keV. So like I said, these, these x-rays, these photons generated, um, are very specific to that transition in that element. This is a basic EDX system right here. We have counts per second per microamp on the y-axis, KEV on the x-axis, and each of these peaks is labeled. So this says calcium K-alpha, that's calcium K-beta, about that 5 to 1 ratio I mentioned earlier. Basic data output screen, we've got the analyte, the result, percent, ppm. Uh, if you're doing plating, you could do uh, micron, nanometer, angstrom. You could do plating density, so uh, microgram per square centimeter and such. This is the type of analysis. Uh, there's two different analyses in EDX. There's, well, two main ones, FP or uh, calibration curve. FP stands for fundamental parameters. It's what's known as the standard list measurement. Um, you can also use calibration standards to generate the, the typical calibration curve. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shimazu has a few EDXs. The EDX 7000 and 8000 are the two newest ones. Elemental range about uh, for the 7000, which is the ones here at the MRL. Sodium uranium with the 8000, there's a different window in the detector that allows you to get down to carbon. But as you can see, as, uh, as the elements get heavier, the detection limits get better. So for some of these down here, 0.1 ppm, but when you're looking at you know, sodium, magnesium, you're about triple digit ppm. What's the assumption of matrices there? Uh, this was done in water. Here, look at this. Matrix is very important um, because density affects not only uh, penetration depth of the irradiating x-ray, but escape depth of the fluorescent x-ray. A um, couple of types of x-rays. We have the sharp peaks here. These are characteristic x-rays. And then this background is what we call continuous x-rays. Where do these come from? Uh, major source of this is Brem Stradling, which was discussed in another presentation this morning. But basically, when one of these electrons is flying around, 
uh, interacts with either another electron or nucleus that changes velocity, either speed or direction. That change uh, causes a, another X-ray to be released. This is constantly happening, which is why we have this background here. X-ray tube, we, uh, uh, the current flowing through a filament, a tungsten filament, generates thermal electrons, which are accelerated towards its target. Uh, in EDS, in the Shimatu, the X is its uh, rhodium target, rhodium over copper. Uh, that generates fluorescent X-rays, uh, eject through this beryllium window, and then are targeted towards the sample. These tubes are very inefficient, less than 1% efficient, so a lot of heat is generated from them, and they need to be cooled. This is the basic layout of uh, one of these Shimazu EDXs. We have an X-ray tube. Filters and collimators uh, are options that can be put in between the, uh, the radiating X-ray and the sample. Uh, we'll cover why you want to use those in a few, few slides. And we've got a sample here and a detector. So it's a bottom radiation system. If it were radiated from the top, then you'd have to account for a sample height. Uh, question you often get, why rhodium? The K rays are efficient at generating fluorescent X-rays from heavy elements, and the L rays are efficient at generating fluorescent X-rays from light elements. Also, rhodium is rarely the subject of analysis, but it's still possible to analyze for rhodium. Um, let's see, we're low on time here. Uh, scatter radiation is also present in the spectrum. We have Compton and Rayleigh scatter. This is how they appear on the spectrum, always in the same place. Compton scatter is a Compton peak is going to appear just to the left or just lower energy than the uh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh scatter peak. Uh, the intensity of the Compton scattering peak influenced by the material density. So, for example, um, Compton scattering in a lead billet uh, is not existent. But if you have some sort of plastic, um, I don't remember what the sample was, then you do see that Compton scattering, scattering peak. Uh, filters. This is something we saw on the slide earlier. I said you could put it in between the X-ray tube and the sample. Um, since rhodium contributes to the spectrum in a couple of different ways, uh, you might have low sensitivity in the areas where they're contributed. Uh, so we would introduce a filter to correct for that. So just some examples. Let's say we have the rhodium L line down here, low energy between 2 and 3 keV. Uh, if you have a light element hiding behind there, you're not going to be able to see that. So if you apply a filter, um, that would now allow you to see chlorine, for example. Uh, again, the background from continuous x-rays, that can also be removed. Um, so your counts per second go down, we're at like up here, it's at like the four, but the background is very high, so your signal to noise ratio increases, so that's why even though this is 0.1 counts per second per micron, that's still uh, much more desirable than this up here. And then again, the other uh, rhodium line, the, the Compton and Rayleigh scattering up at the higher end, 20, 25 keV, can be removed. The EDX detector, the, on the EDX 7000 and 8000, the two current models, is an SDD silicone drift detector. In the past, uh, they were silly or silicon pin detectors. Uh, still common in certain applications, but not in the newer high end, the, the bench top models. Um, some of the benefits, a silly detector, very high resolution, but has to be cooled um, by liquid nitrogen to about 100, negative 150 degrees. Uh, so, I mean, that's obviously not desirable to work with if you can avoid it. Uh, silicon pin, uh, moderate resolution, low count rates, maybe 10,000 counts per second, but it's able to be pelted and cooled, also much more inexpensive to manufacture. Uh, general layout of a silicon pin detector, uh, we've got two planar contacts, an anode and a cathode electric field between them. X-ray hits the silicon in the middle of there. Uh, these charge carriers are then swept towards either the anode or the cathode, depending on their charge and the, by the electric field. That creates a current pulse, that little eye right there, and that is what's measured, detected, counted, uh, and then amplified and turned into a signal. Uh, silicon drift detector, the back end is relatively the same. We have a planar cathode and then a very small circular anode right here, 
and um, annular uh, electrodes around that, that small anode. Uh, these electrodes are biased to create a magnetic field. Same interaction here, you've got an incident X-ray interacting with the silicate in there. Uh, these charges are then directed or they drift towards the anode where they're collected and then measured and processed in a, in a similar fashion. Uh, the benefit or yeah, the benefits of, of using a silicon drift detector or, uh, is that you can increase the active volume with this detector but keeping the noise very low because the anode state is the same size. Uh, so you get um, very good resolution, very high count rates, capable of over a million counts per second. This is one of the uh, Amptec SDDs, Amptec manufactures detectors in the Shimatsu EDXs. Okay. Some optional hardware worth noting. Um, analysis can be done in air, helium, uh, or under vacuum. For light elements, uh, oxygen, CO2 in the atmosphere will absorb radiation. Uh, which is not desirable because it's going to lower sensitivity for the light elements, the low Z elements. Um, just as an example here, uh, so we've got two samples, one done in vacuum, or same sample, one analysis in vacuum, one analysis in air. So you can see not only the uh, huge increase in silicon sensitivity, but these three peaks right here, sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, were not detectable in air or quite vacuum. Same concept with the helium purge, up here at the top of this graph uh, is, um, let's see, uh, analysis or sorry, sensitivity in helium versus air. So we set the sensitivity in helium as 100%, and you can see the relative intensity start to drop off you know, at uh, most effective down here, but up near even titanium is where it starts. Just some example applications to, to wrap it up here so you can see some real life. Uh, usage of this technology. Um, I won't read through these, but it will be available in the video if you want to pause it and see. So, but as you can see, EDX is applicable to a variety of industries. These are the current application notes of, uh, produced by Shimazu. These are available on the Shimazu application website. So if you see anything here that sparks your interest, feel, feel free to visit that and read up on it. Okay, now to the applications. Uh, one example here, foreign matter identification. So we've got some clean plastic part here and something in there which is a contaminant. How do we, let's figure out what that is. We can analyze just this area down here, just this area there, subtract out the, the difference, uh, and that looks like stainless steel. Um, some of the things done here at the MRL, fill thickness measurement of titanium oxide on silicon, uh, this was done, let's see, let's see how long. Um, February 9th. Okay. I was looking at the time. So 100 seconds. So about a minute and a half. Uh, came back with a, about 26 nanometers. This was also done on, previously done on the XRD, uh, and the results agreed. Another application we have a brick from an annealing furnace uh, just to determine the what this contaminant was here versus the clean area. Um, so that's something that all, was also done relatively quickly. Um, I can't see the graph that well, but it looks like there was a much higher concentration of zinc in the contaminated part than the clean part. Another interesting thing, uh, carrot orange juice. I believe I was told that the, um, there are a couple different juices here and you were able to see a higher uh, potassium content in one versus the other. Strontium contamination. There was a sample, uh, it was analyzed on an XRD. It seemed to be strontium, but the user or the system wasn't able to differentiate strontium from other peaks in the material. So, a very quick analysis on EDS confirmed this. And lastly, in some regard, we had a sample that was analyzed. Uh, hafnium came up, that was unexpected, uh, but the contaminant was able to be traced down to the chamber in which the sample was made. So I know I flew through that very quickly, and we've got a minute or two for questions. So if anybody has any, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and again, I'll be up at a table. Um, if 
I left any lingering questions. I'm sure I did because I just flew through that. So we have two questions from Oklahoma. Maybe. Okay, so we have two questions from Oklahoma State yeah. University. The first one is, what is the sensitivity in parts per million of detecting rhodium using a rhodium source by EXRF? Um, well, I will just visit. Let's see. I'm just going to reference that chart here because I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so according to the chart, about 0.1 ppm, very, this, again this is matrix dependent, but the triple digit ppb. In the ideal analysis. Okay. Uh, the second question is, can you comment on the best practices for sample preparation when you have a matrix of a light and heavy elements? Of light and heavy elements? Um, it really depends on sample form, specifically not necessarily composition. Uh, for lighter elements, um, you want to minimize the chance for uh, any absorption of the fluorescent x-rays from light elements. So for example, if you had a powder, um, two ways you could prep it, one of which be, would be to put it in a sample cell and then put a film over it. A film could be mylar, polypropylene, ultralene. Um, the films are very thin, but they still do absorb some radiation. So ideally, you would have a hydraulic press and be able to press the sample into a pellet and then be able to take that pellet and stick it directly into the EDX with nothing in between, uh, nothing but air in between the uh, detector, the entry source, the sample, and the detector. So can you control the uh, incident angle? So no. you can tell? No, that is set. Oh, okay. Yep. You can control two voltage, uh, you have two options, 15 kV or 50 kV. Yeah, so you can control the shallow, the angle, then you can have a better control of the uh, uh, absorption effect. All right, but you, yeah, 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 the, the angle's fixed. Any more questions? Uh, it's like surface roughness or any geometry constraints, do you need to have a flat surface? Like yeah, uh, ideally for the best analysis, um, you do want a smooth, flat surface. Okay, another question. Now, what's the spot size of this instrument? Um, with the collimator option, you can focus it down to one millimeter. Uh, so you can choose between one, three, five, or ten millimeters. Okay. 